Well, welcome back to Find the Way. We're delighted you've joined us today. We're in part three of the Book of Ruth, and that might not mean a lot to you, but what we're talking about will mean a whole lot because we're going to talk a little bit about integrity. Maybe we should talk a whole lot about it. Integrity mm. is such a, an interesting subject. It really is, and um, I don't know that we see a lot of integrity these days. When we look at the media, when we look at politics, when we look at entertainment world, we've got all of these men, you know, being called out, uh, and women, of course, That's right. th in this day and age, uh, for their integrity issues. But character's important to God. Well, you know, and part of the whole process of what we're talking about is I should introduce you, just not to assume that you're here. Right. <laughs> we're really delighted that Laura Lynn is with us here on Find the Way. Thank you for co-hosting oh, this month. It's just been I'm fantastic delighted. having you here. Well, you know what? Your daughter's shoes are, are, are big to fill, not that her feet are big, but uh, I'm <laughs> blessed. I'm blessed to be here, and you're a joy to work with. Well, you know, talking about ladies' shoes, I probably could say a little bit about that. Having five daughters and then my wife, I've bought more than my share of <laughs> shoes. Talk oh, about compromising integrity. Wonderful. I mean, where does it all go right, with that? Right, right. But you're right. We live in a day and age where so much is changing. The hashtag Me Too issue yes. has just brought to the surface mm. the pain that so many people, so many women especially, have mm -hmm. gone through because men have not acted in integrity. Right. And you know what? Um, God wants to be able to trust our character. And he. there are sometimes some tests that we have in life, like in the book of Ruth, where God you know, there, he, he allows some circumstances where we might, we might be tempted to not even trust who God is because the pain is so great. But God gives us opportunity to see his power show up when we act with integrity, even when we can't really see what he's up to. You know, you've summarized this so well, and because as we come into the third chapter of the book of Ruth, we're going to talk about two people that acted with incredible integrity when temptation could have easily swayed them to go the other way. And I got a word for you today, is that regardless of your past, that's your past. That was then, but this is now. You can become, as of today, a man, a woman of integrity. We're going to talk about that today on Find the Way. We're glad you've joined us. Check us out, findtheway.tv. We'll be right back. talking about integrity, I'm reminded of the words of Lewis Smedes, who wrote this. He said, if I had just one gift to give to you, it would be the gift of integrity. That when you come to the last chapter of your life, you could say with the psalmist in Psalm 26, here it is, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. What a way to go. A name that some of you might also know is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran pastor who was imprisoned by his own German people in World War II. And he died uh, 10 days just before uh, the Allies came into Germany. And while he was waiting for the Gestapo steps to come to his cell to take him out, to hang him because he had stood up against the Nazi regime, he wondered what kind of men and women they would need in the next season of life to restore the country. And he thought about that and he said, what the country needs are not people of genius, not brilliant tacticians or strategists, but simple, straightforward, honest men and women, people of integrity. Bonhoeffer, we need you now. As we come to Ruth chapter 3, we discover how integrity gets fleshed out in the hustle and bustle of life, in the daily grind of life, where it was, to say the very least, very hard. Ruth and Naomi are hard pressed, they have very little to eat, and Ruth is gleaning sheaves. That's not what I would call the ideal way to make a living. But you know, as we begin to think about integrity, it's not something that you drum up when the need arises. Matter of fact, integrity is a state of being. It implies wholeness, and it implies honesty, and it implies uprightness. Think about that. That's what you want in the people that you work with, and that, I believe, is what you want to represent yourself that's flowing out of your inner person. I want you to know that it can happen. How does integrity apply to my life? How does it apply to yours? Well, first of all, it becomes a reflection of who I allow to influence me. 
You know, it says in Acts chapter 4, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they had been hanging out with Jesus. Who are you allowing to influence you? Integrity applies to my life because it also becomes a rationale for how I choose to handle life's issues. Am I going to be doing deals under the table? And am I going to be telling the little white lies? And am I just going to go along with the secular mindset because it's too hard to push back or for someone to say, oh, you're really different. You're kind of weird or different. I've also learned this, that integrity becomes a regulating valve for how I choose to walk and talk and how I respond in the situation. Being that person of integrity is, uh, is so critical to the well-being of our lives. And that's what we're going to unpack today at Find the Way in the story of Ruth and Naomi and as they meet Boaz. But with me, of course, is Rudy and some of your own journey. You've had to wear it, haven't you? I have. I love that you brought up Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer right now because uh, what an incredible man. I found myself in that position. In our nation, uh, we have a uh, curriculum that is going into every school across Canada eventually. It's really hit British Columbia where they are going to teach every child that they are gender fluid starting in kindergarten. When I found this out, Mike, I had to decide if I was going to be uh, held back and quiet because of the name calling because you know you get attacked if you, you come against this. You get labeled if you have a different opinion. If you have a different opinion and uh, what I've said is I, I love Canada. You can be gay and lesbian and trans and Christian and Sikh and Muslim and we can live in peace and that's how it should be. But we should not. But your not, voice is being put down isn't it? It is being put down and all I'm saying is children are sacred. Do not teach our children children in school that they are gender fluid, that they are not male and female the way God created them. Don't take their identity because we don't teach our religion in school, so we don't want our children indoctrinated either. So in saying such a simple statement, how have you had to process some of the, uh, the, the very mean and nasty comments, which we would want that to be said for any of the faith groups represented. You've already mentioned them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how have I've, you handled it? I've had to say, uh, whatever you want to call me, I'm willing to take it. Whatever you want to do to me, uh, whoever, uh, however you want to assault my life, because they have. Uh, there's been a lot of kickback that's come against me, but I've decided uh, I will not bow and I will not be silent as long as our children in our nation are being robbed of their identity and being told that they are gender fluid, I will not be silent. That's how I've dealt with it. Well, and I appreciate the fact that, uh, Laura Lynn, you're modeling integrity as you walk through that. And whatever it is the situation you're in today, we want to help you to realize that God wants you to be a man. He wants you to be a woman of integrity, someone that people can look up to and say, wow, I'm proud to know them. I'm proud to walk with them because they walk their walk and they talk their talk. That can be you. We're going to be right back and find the way as we unpack the book of Ruth. Hey, you've heard the tagline, the opportunity of a lifetime. We want to tell you about one of those right now. I'm here with Grant Seip, uh, Executive Director of One Life, One Chance, and I'm going to add in one huge opportunity. Tell me. Exactly, Mike. We want everyone to have the opportunity to come down to the Baja Peninsula of Mexico with us, with a team, build a house for a needy family, and build relationships with the people down there. It'll change your life. It'll transform your thinking of how you build community. So you're saying I can bring my friends, business colleagues, people Absolutely. like that? Bring them all. Come one, come all. Bring a bit of money. I understand for about six, seven thousand dollars you yeah. can impact a family. Come for a week. How do we find out information, Grant? I'm going to tell you how. If you click on the link at the bottom of our page today, right now on the screen, we'll uh, get you in touch with Grant right away. One life, one chance, your opportunity. When we deal with the issue of integrity, one of the things that we often struggle with is, can I trust God? How is he going to meet my need? In the book of Ruth, you need to understand something so that it begins to make a little more sense. God had built in a provision 
for women whose husbands had died. Uh, the provision for a widow would be that if there was no other children to take care of them, that the next of kin, maybe it would be the husband's brother or cousin, but whoever was the next of kin, they would assume responsibility to raise up a family in memory of the man who had died and also to take over the control and operation of all the land. And that was part of God's provision. In this situation, uh, Ruth goes, and it, remember we said this a week ago, it just happened by chance to end up in the field of a man named Boaz. And Boaz, as we will discover, was one of the relatives. Initially, Ruth and Naomi think that he's the next in, kin, next in line. He's like the, the brother or the, the first cousin. But that's not to be the case. Actually, he's the second cousin. So tuck that little piece of information in the back of your mind as we unpack the passage, because it's in the daily grind of life that in our integrity becomes tested. And what Naomi tells her uh, daughter-in-law Ruth to do is to go down to the threshing floor at night where she's been gathering. And after Boaz has eaten and after he has uh, had his fill of drink, when he falls asleep, custom was that the woman who wanted to be taken care of would go and lie at the feet of the man who was the next of kin, or as the Bible calls this guy, the kinsman redeemer. Now, just by the way, my wife has told me she'll never sleep at my feet, and we laugh and joke about that, but that was the custom of the day. And so can you imagine, uh, Boaz is sound asleep, Ruth goes and she puts on her best attire, she wears perfume, and she goes and she sleeps at his feet. In the middle of the night, the Bible says, Boaz wakes up with a start and he looks and he says, oh my goodness, what's this woman doing here uh, at, at my feet? And suddenly he clicks in and he says to her, you really are a woman of integrity, the way you've handled yourself. She hasn't compromised herself, she hasn't put herself forward, and he says, I want you to go back to your mother even before daylight comes. So Boaz resists the opportunity to even have sexual relationships and to take advantage of this younger woman. And as a result, uh, both the integrity of Boaz, the integrity of Ruth are preserved. Difficult decisions to make in the middle of the night. But both could do that because they knew who they were trusting in. You will find that your integrity is more often than not tempted, uh, or rather tested when you are tempted. Maybe it's something in the middle of the night, something that just catches you off hand. But it's in those moments that you need to remember who it is that you're serving, who it is you're following, and especially who it is that you're trusting in. We're going to come back in a few moments after an interview with Bill Hogg, and we're going to summarize what happened to Boaz and Ruth when their integrity was put on the line. Hey, you've heard the tagline, the opportunity of a lifetime. We want to tell you about one of those right now. I'm here with Grant Seip, uh, Executive Director of One Life, One Chance, and I'm going to add in one huge opportunity. Tell me. Exactly, Mike. We want everyone to have the opportunity to come down to the Baja Peninsula of Mexico with us, with a team, build a house for a needy family, and build relationships with the people down there. It'll change your life, it'll transform your thinking of how you build communities. So you're saying I can bring my friends, business colleagues, people Absolutely. like that? Bring them all. Come one, come all. Bring a bit of money. I understand for about six, seven thousand dollars you yeah. can impact a family. Come for a week. How do we find out information, Grant? I'm going to tell you how. If you click on the link at the bottom of our page today, right now on the screen, we'll uh, get you in touch with Grant right away. One life, one chance, your opportunity. Welcome back. I am here with Bill Hogg and he's uh, here for the second week. Thank you so much. You're with C2C Network and you have an organization that absolutely loves to plant churches across the nation. But I want to ask you something. In the final chapter of Matthew 28, these are Jesus' words. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Why should we give all this credibility to someone named Jesus? 
Well, I think we've got to take him at his, his word and not redefine him. I, I remember I was working one summer in IBM uh, in the loading bay driving a forklift truck, which was much more fun than when I worked the previous year in the office. And I asked one of the guys who was smoking a doobie, which was illegal then in Scotland, who do you think Jesus is? He says, I think he was a space cowboy. And I said, wow, on what basis did you come up with that intriguing conclusion? And it was just like the first dumb thing that came out of his head. And so I think we've got to take Jesus mm. seriously. Mm. And when we take Jesus seriously, that means we will take note of his self-descriptions. Mm. John Stott said, uh, he spoke of the utterly egocentric claims of Jesus of Nazareth. And so you've got Confucius and Buddha, other religious leaders who point to a system, point to a way, uh, point to religious rituals, but Jesus persistently points to himself mm. and he makes jaw-dropping claims. So for example, at one point he says, before Abraham was, I am. And John's gospel is littered with all these I am that I am sayings. Mm. And we've got to understand that Jesus is dialing into a Jewish consciousness that Yahweh describes himself in Exodus 3 as I am that I am. So in other words, Jesus makes the jaw-dropping claim that he is the eternal, uncreated God of the universe mm. with flesh and bones. Mm. So a buddy of mine and I were out hanging. He's an ex-Catholic. He's still kind of haunted by Jesus. And we have some terrific conversations. And one night we were having a tasty beverage together. And he said to me, Bill, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God, whatever that means? I said, yeah. And I'll tell you what it means, what it really, really means, what it means, what it means, what it really, really means, what? And he says, what it means, what it means? I said, it means that Jesus is fully God as if he was not human and fully human as if he was not God at the same time without contradiction. Mm. Robert Farrar Capon said, Jesus is God in all his Clark Kentness. So it's wow. politically correct. Superman. Superman, but I mean, Superman's a superhero and Jesus is the greatest hero of the cosmos, but he comes to his invulnerability and obedience and we're saved by his perfect life of loving obedience where he lives the life that we cannot live for us in our place and he dies the death that we deserve to die because mm. Laurel, and you look at the world you look at canada you go wow i'm perplexed because it's beautiful and it's broken at the same time how can that possibly be and it can possibly be because our loving creator spoke the universe into existence by the word of his power and then kind of folded his arms and like a gleeful toddler said, it's good, it's good, it's very good. And then he creates a man and a woman together for partnership and then they rebel against him and it's not good, it's broken. Our original parents, wow. instead of submitting to the kingly rule and authority of the loving creator, mm. rebel in an act of treason. And ever since then, then things have been out of whack and we've needed rescued. And Jesus comes to rescue us as the God man. Well, you know, that's what we're talking to people every single day, you know, uh, who are trying to find their path. They're trying to see what can heal that brokenness inside of me. And someone's listening right now and they're saying, Bill, I hear what you're saying, but how can I believe this figure? I, I don't even know if he really existed. I mean, how do I know this is the Jesus? How do I know what is going to heal my broken, messed up life? Well, I believe this book is the word of God. It's a God breathe book, but a listener might say, sorry, I'm not buying that. But what we can say without fear of contradiction whatsoever, that Bible is historically reliable. It's a book that has accuracy, precision, and integrity. And then we go, okay, and there's lots of documentary evidence to support the textual integrity of Scripture. Right. In, in, in fact, uh, you know, all kinds of documents that are not even scriptural or biblical or, you know, from Christians that state, yeah, this shows that this has been, uh, you know, that, that this is a true historical document and we can rely that there was a man named Jesus. Whether you choose to believe the veracity of his sonship of God, there was a man and these things truly did happen. Well, that's right. So the, these things happen. And then you say, okay, let's not have a revisionist Jesus created in your own image. Let's look at who he is. He's tender. He's fierce. 
And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says he's come to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, his mother and his stepdad didn't have the freedom to choose his name. Mm. His name speaks of his mission. Mm. You know, it didn't say, you know, Joseph didn't say to Mary, you know, I, I've got an uncle, Fred, and he's been a great mentor. Why don't we call the Messiah Fred? Wasn't an option. You'll call him Jesus, yeah. Yeshua, Joshua, because he's the deliverer. He will save mm. his people from their sins. And the other name in Matthew, the beginning of that uh, gospel that you quoted is Emmanuel, God right. with us. So a long time yeah. ago, John Osborne had a song, what if God was one of us? just a slob like one of us, like a stranger on the bus home. So that's a great question. What would happen if God became fully human? And the answer is, Jesus is the best selfie that God ever took of himself. Oh, that's good. So he's you, the best selfie. He's the best in selfie. Our generation. Absolutely. Oh, and you, so Bill. if you want to understand the heart of God, the purpose of God, then you've got to take a look at Jesus. You sure do. Thank you, Bill. I think that for someone whose heart might be breaking right now, if you can heed these words, he's, he's really Jesus. He is a, a real savior that can help you. He can come into that broken place and he can make a difference. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Mike Sherbonneau. I'm the host of Find the Way and so glad that you're watching with us today. Find the Way started as a radio program a few years ago, and now we've morphed into a television program. We're delighted to be in your home and sharing with you what I believe are the important truths that will help you in the journey of life. And that important truth centers around the person and work of Jesus Christ. Find the Way is all about helping people to find and follow Jesus. But hey, I'm Canadian. And being Canadian means that not only do I love coffee, Tim Hortons, not only do I like to play hockey, but I also realize that my fellow Canadians have a lot of questions and we're a very private group of people. That's why Find the Way helps to unpack the spiritual issues that people are dealing with and point them in a direction that will bring them life and wholeness and meaning. I hope that you'll help me in this journey. If you want to support what we're doing, you can go to findtheway.tv and be one of our partners with us. But thank you for watching and thank you for being a part of what we're doing. The issue of integrity oftentimes is an issue that revolves around the question, can I trust God? A number of years ago, I was with my youngest daughter and she was at a camp and the camp was famous for its zip line. She said, Dad, you gotta go up it. And so the fact that she went up it meant that I had to go up it. But I was sure that that tree, the pole, 42 feet in the air, wasn't designed for uh, someone my size. But nonetheless, I went up to the top. It was a Christian camp, and at the, camp, at the top of the pole, before you hooked onto your zip line, there was a Bible verse, and it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> and I thought, no, that is the wrong verse. It should be from Psalm 23 that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But nonetheless, I have not forgotten that. The verse that was there was, you have to trust in God. You see, integrity means that I have to trust God. I have to trust that His ways are the right ways because many times I'm gonna be tempted to go the exact opposite. That's the situation with Ruth. Ruth is in this situation where she could compromise, she could sleep with Boaz and try to uh, further her situation so that he would then marry her for sure. But instead, she just does the, the appropriate things and doesn't try to seduce him. Interesting that Boaz, he as well, doesn't take advantage of Ruth. Difficult things in the heat of temptation. Integrity speaks not only in the areas of our sexuality, but it also can impact the way we do our finances. It can be the way that we be, speak to people. Do we always speak the truth? Do we tear them down? Do we build them up? But over and over again, integrity comes to us in the midst of the daily grind of life. It's in the midst of the daily journey. Integrity cries out to us uh, when no one else is looking. And that's what we see in this passage. It was in the middle of the night when no one was looking and no one would have known. But that's not true because God knew and God was watching. And he is watching you and me. It's not as if he's some celestial Scrooge who wants to zap us of our jollies. No, we have a God who cares deeply for us. And he says, child of God, trust me, 
The mess that you're in is something that you can recover from when you walk with me. One of the promises of Scripture over and over again is that we know that in all things, God is working out the good for those who love Him. At times, it might not always seem to be our good because it is His good. But when we trust Him, we can become the men and women of integrity that He wants us to be. One of the key things that comes in this chapter 3 is that when Ruth goes back home early that morning to see Naomi and tells her what happens, Naomi has this to say to her. She replied, she said, Wait, my daughter, in verse 18, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today as your kinsman redeemer. She said, You need to wait, Ruth. It's sometimes so hard to wait. You know, the psalmist says to be still and know that I am God, to see how God will fight on our behalf. The advice given to Moses when he was at the Red Sea, when the, the natural thing would be to panic, when the natural thing would be to compromise on who he was and what he claimed to believe and to lose his integrity, God comes to him and says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, for the Lord your God will fight for you and you will see this. That becomes the issue with our integrity. Can I trust? Can I wait on God? It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew about as we talked about at the very beginning. It's what Lewis Smead was referring to when he said, if there's one gift that we could give, it would be the gift of integrity. It's what the psalmist says that when we come to the last chapter of our life, we would say, vindicate me, O God, because I have walked in my integrity. That's how God wants you and I to live. That becomes the legacy that we give. And Laura Lynn, as you begin to think of that whole issue of legacy, of, of integrity, and the journey you've been on, what, what's been the secrets that you've discovered how God's helped you? I just wanted to, to shout, that's awesome, uh, while you were speaking that, Mike, because uh, it is so hard to wait. Uh, we all go through things. Some of us, I'm going through a difficult challenge where I'm seeing that, you know, there's a curriculum being put into the schools and I, I want God to get that out right now. But um, God in all of our lives, whether it's a financial or an emotional or relational issue, He kind of has a way of stretching us so that we get maximum lesson out of <laughs> everything we're going through. And we always think He should have showed up a couple days earlier. A couple days earlier, that's right. And maybe that's what you're thinking as well in your own journey. So let me encourage you with this. I hope you go to our website. We have online mentors who will be there to talk with you. You click on our website at www.findtheway.tv. Findtheway.tv and go to the button that says uh, find a mentor. And there are people there who will talk to you. Maybe you're dealing with a discouragement, maybe a divorce, maybe there's a form of depression. Maybe there's uh, something that you've done, you're saying, can God forgive me for that? There's people who will walk with you. And we want you to know today that God wants you to be a man, to be a woman of integrity because of what Jesus has done. He has forgiven us, as Bill talked about. That is the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of knowing Jesus. And that gift is available for you today. Thanks for watching our show.